hello everybody who's here right now. Give everybody a couple of minutes here to get gathered up. Just go through the daily news a little bit today. Uh, just break down some of the basic information that's happening out there. There's a lot. There's a, a lot of stuff. Nothing major today. So I'll give everybody a few minutes. Let me know when you're signed in here. Just pop up some uh, comments in the in the comment section, the chat section, and we'll go ahead and get started. Make sure we're live here. Looks like we're good to go. Oh, that's me. All right. Get folks signed in here. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight. Uh, good to see you all here, here this evening. Uh, pretty basic evening here in America in 2024. We are dealing with some uh, absolute chaos across the board. Nothing we're uh, not used to at this point in time in America. But, of course, we're going to always keep this in the same kind of flow. We're going to go with money, politics, and religion. Today, we're heavily focused more on international affairs. I think that's going to be uh, a big point for us. So do we have a, a sound issue? Sound is okay? All right. Uh, I think we're going to have a big issue out there. It uh, looks like things are brewing between Russia and Ukraine again. I'll go through that. I'll go through a little bit about uh, some of the things happening overseas. Uh, our, our election is really a clown show. It is the new bread and circus. So I, I'm trying to pay as little attention to it as possible. Although I will say I am uh, pretty excited to watch the replay of the 18-minute interview of Kamala Harris today to figure out uh, if there was anything intelligent said in there whatsoever, which foregone conclusion you know, uh, spoiler alert, probably not. Uh, but let's start with money. That's where we're going to begin right now. The markets themselves. I know a lot of folks, um, you know, comment here or send me uh, direct messages and things like that, or text me or call me, things like that. And just let me know that some of the information we're getting here, uh, giving to you on this on this show is some stuff you're not going to find anywhere else. You're not even going to find it really in uh, big publications unless you're a trader or investor paying attention to everything. So it's important you know these things along the way. Uh, some of my resource, uh, resources for uh, research out there uh, that are, are pretty widely used. Very good job is a Kobisi letter on Twitter. They do a fantastic job, Macro Edge. Uh, I'm not a master researcher. I am more of a, a baker to kind of put these things together and see what they mean to you and see how you can benefit from all these things um, and, and, and get your life in order and make sure you're prepared for what's coming because I don't think we're looking at anything good in any area at all except for possibly political change. Uh, I'm not saying that to black pill anybody or anything like that. It's just just what I see. And if you've been following me long enough, you know that I don't really put my emotions in anything when I'm trying to prove a point or trying to get information across. It's just information. Things are just things. Events are events. Uh, I try to leave emotion out of it and make sure that we're getting the most out of data, which is really important. So first data. As we have this political campaign, this election, which, you know, some polls say Trump is losing. Most polls say that he is dominating the, the election, which I think is probably the more realistic, definitely the more realistic. But we'll see in the end. You know, we don't know. There are a lot of good election changes like we talked about a couple of days ago. But I think it's important to note that for your friends and family who think this is just another election, it's important to note the policy that we do have from the Democrats, which is important to note, because if they are going to vote for them, these are the things that are going to happen. And the new tax plan is designed to increase tax revenues in this country by $5 trillion. Currently, we, that's double, right? So we, we currently collect $4.7 trillion in tax revenue. Uh, the new plan with unrealized gains and things like that coming out. So it's the most ridiculous plan in the world when bankruptcies are at an all-time high. That's personal and corporate. Both of them are now at all-time highs or at bare minimum, depending on, on stats you look at, bare minimum 15-year highs. People can't afford bread. Uh, the housing market's in shambles. Nobody can buy anything. Nobody can sell anything at a profit anymore. And that is a real big problem in an economy, especially when a new regime is coming in uh, touting that they're going to raise taxes double where they are now, more than double, about 54% increase in taxes. So just imagine where we are right now, plus true inflation being around 9 to 18%, depending on what numbers you run. About four years from now, when you're paying twice as much in taxes and about 40% more for everything that you purchase while wages are increasing at about 1.4%. That's the reality of, of this, this model, this plan coming out from the Harris campaign, which is ludicrous. What else is ludicrous is that our GDP went up from 1.4% to 3% this past quarter. 
Uh, as I said many times, I'll say the big GDP report to pay attention to is going to be in October. That's the big one to look forward to. That's where they report on multiple different things that kind of close at this time of year from defense spending and other, other areas. It's pretty clear right now that what we're doing is we're using overseas contributions in order to bolster the GDP at a time where the, con the economy is collapsing. So your average everyday person is going to look for CPI numbers, which are, you know, consumer PSYOP index. It's just how, how hard can you PSYOP the people on fake numbers when they're actually living the real pain along with our GDP. Like th those are the two metrics that the average person looks at to determine whether or not this is a good economy. And when we look at those two numbers, they're actually not too bad. 2.9% to uh, G GD, or excuse me, G uh, CPI and a 3% GDP. When you put those things together from a, a, a long point of view, you're, you're going to look at it and say, you know what? This isn't that bad. The economy is not that bad. And that would be normally right, except for the fact that the way the GDP is being manipulated for the first two years of their administration it was being manipulated while natural gas prices were in the mid 20s, sometimes $30 range per unit. They were selling for $2 in America. So they restricted that industry, uh, made it almost impossible to be able to export any natural gas for a, a domestic producer. And then they captured all of it through the four BlackRock owned government sub subsidies that end up buying natural gas and then shipping it overseas for massive profits. So essentially the profits in the first two years of the administration were all about rigging the energy sector in order to make their GDP look good while all consumer numbers, which normally drive a GDP, were being slaughtered. Now this has changed in the last two years because we have two new catastrophes to deal with. We now have Israel and Iran, Ukraine, we have all these foreign wars that are occurring. We're sending uh, military aid and money already to Taiwan preemptively for China striking. There are multiple areas around the world that are about to erupt. And what we're doing, like we talked about yesterday, how Ukraine is being used as basically a, a money laundering scheme and a profit center for Western investors while they're using capital that's coming in from the EU and from the United States for funding for the war, but it's actually going to pay for utility companies. So you can buy, buy their bonds really cheap and then get paid off in full in, in half the time, making 50, 60, 70% profits. The way that the GDP is being manipulated right now is through defense spending. So if you ever really wonder, and I haven't read the GDP report from today, so I'm, I'm, I'm shooting off the hip based on watching every day for years and years and years and knowing the trends of corruption. Uh, so I'll verify this next week when I actually dig through the GDP on the weekend, which is the best time to, to do it is on Lazy Sunday right after church. Because uh, it's really boring and you get a great nap when you read the GDP report. However, what we're doing right now, if you really think about this, so we, we haven't really sent a lot of cash. We've sent a lot of cash in the grand scheme of things. We send a lot of cash everywhere. However, when it, look, when it comes to Ukraine in particular, we've sent a lot of equipment. So what happens here is it's equipment that's made by U.S. manufacturers, your Northrop, your, your Raytheon, all of your big defense contractors. They have these things in inventory already. So what they do is they'll send our existing military equipment over to Ukraine, and then we have to replenish that military equipment. And now we buy back all of our jet fighters and tanks and missiles and bombs and body armor and magazines and rifles from all mostly U.S. manufacturers at a premium at about 25% because inflation doesn't just hurt bread and food and things like that. It actually impacts the defense sector, especially raw materials like steel and like lead. So in aluminum and different alloys to make uh, fighter pilots and jets, jet planes and things like that. So this is not necessarily an unusual thing. This happens all the time, but it's happening in mass quantities. So the way it's working right now, and this is just my guess before I dig through the report, is that we're say, uh, say we send $50 billion in military equipment over to Ukraine. That military equipment is now out of the military, our military's hands. It's now in the Ukrainian military hands. And what we're doing is going back to the same defense contractors and paying for cash to replenish, replenish our stock in, pile and in inventory with American tax dollars at a premium. So say there was a, a bulk of fighter pilots that were purchased four years ago sitting in the military on Terramax all over at our different bases. They're going to get rid of those. And they paid just hypothetical uh, numbers. Say they paid $2 billion per or $1 billion per fighter pilot, fighter jet. Now that price is like $1.4 billion. So not only are we 
laundering money through tax dollars over to Ukraine by giving them military equipment, having to bolster that, that now shows as revenue in the U.S. So that is absolutely doctoring the GDP. So saying we have a 3% GDP report is being doctored by all of that equipment we send over to Ukraine. At the same time, we're getting less for our money. So in that example where we have jet planes or fighter pilot fighter planes that we're going to send over to Ukraine, that now cost, call it, just to be kind, call it 25% more than they did when we purchased them. We are now going to spend the same amount of money for the inventory that we sent over. So if we call it $50 billion in financing, we're going to have $50 billion in cash to replenish that stockpile. Now, when we do that, we're getting, based on those numbers, 75% less fighter jets. So not only is this a money laundering scheme to bolster the GDP before an election, this is also a very dangerous, dangerous game of cat and mouse when it comes to global conflict and, and warfare all around the world. So pay attention to the October GDP. Uh, next week, I will give a breakdown of what I see in the GDP report. Uh, but again, I read those on Sunday when I'm just relaxing. Now, government spending is way out of hand. We always know this, uh, but here's a way to quantify it. So uh, the last fiscal year, the last year, one 12 month cycle of government spending, our government spent $6.8 trillion. That's in direct competition with the revenue. And again, revenue is theft. So the fact that the IRS is called the Internal Revenue Service when they're a tax collector was like one of the original left-wing liberal communist designs of naming something so it doesn't sound as awful as it actually is. It is revenue for the government, but that revenue comes out of our pocket. So in essence, we are always funding every war, every conflict, and every campaign or psychological operation run against us. We pay for that. So $6.8 trillion in government funding against $4.71 trillion in revenue, tax dollars. Now, let me ask you a question. You're all smart people out there. If I went to you and I said, hey, listen, uh, I want to raise a trillion dollars for my company, and because we do $4.7 trillion in revenue. Well, the first question you're going to ask is, well, how much debt do you? Well, I only have you know, $6.8 trillion this year but I actually have 35 trillion, but only 6.8 trillion this year. So it was actually only adding about $2 trillion to that debt. Would you invest in that company? I would run as fast as I could from that company, unless they had the blessing of the Prince of Darkness on high, like Nvidia, who can get away with these things and still continue to climb and show revenues that are based on accrual accounting and not cash accounting. Cash accounting needs to be a standard embedded in every single public company. I've explained this in a couple episodes, but I'll try to do it simply this way. The difference between cash and accrual accounting is pretty simple. In cash accounting, I make a sale for $100 million of my product. You pay me $100 million. I tell, tell the market that I have $100 million in revenue. That's pretty logical. In accrual accounting, what I do is I say I signed a contract with Joe Blow Company for $100 million in future sales, and they paid me, I don't know, 10%. So I brought in $10 million, but I have $100 million in revenue that I haven't realized yet. So that realized, unrealized word is being used, to, I believe, to educate the American people to understand what it means and how dangerous it can be with your financial future, your taxes, and also your investment portfolio. So that's how that works. Now, the $6.8 trillion in funding actually breaks down. 46% of it went to Medicare uh, and Social Security. Pretty normal stuff. 27% to defense and non-defense spending, which is kind of blended. 13% of that, of that entire budget of $6.8 trillion went to interest expense, meaning we were paying somebody else a VIG, like a, like a loan shark. We were just paying off the interest, not our principal. 13% of $6.8 trillion in government spending went to just paying interest on loans. This is ludicrous. This cannot continue. It will continue. <laughs> That's the guarantee I can give you today. This will continue. And it will continue for a long time because in order to get out of the hole we're in, we're going to have to do something very drastic uh, with the next administration. And only only they know what that is and they still have to get in there. And I believe they will. But, um, but we're going to have a lot of work ahead of us. Now, the Richmond Manufacturing Index, which there's about six different manufacturing index. These are things that measure the amount of manufacturing activity that we have in the country, just to keep it very low level and simple. It is now at the lowest level since 2020. Now, when I bring up 2020 or 2008, Number one, we have dozens. There are dozens of major indices and indicators out there that are now at their 2008 or 2020 numbers. 
Neither one of those two years was any good for your portfolio. Well, I can take that back. 2020 was good for your portfolio because all the stimulus checks either went into crypto, steak dinners and purses, or they went into the stock market. And I don't know, I, it, it appears to me like we're coming close to the next stimmy season, which I think is the worst idea in the world. Um, I know some people need the help. I, I, I completely get that. But for an entire nation to receive free money is communist by itself. We don't need a government, a big, a big brother, a big daddy uh, to give us money when we go out on Friday night. We're all adults and grown people. If we actually had a good economy, we'd all have jobs and we'd be able to pay for anything that we wanted to on our own, especially if we didn't have to pay taxes. However, I digress. These manufacturing indices, what they show us is manufacturing activity. Now that we're at the year 2020 level, we are now sitting in a, a, a powder keg, a, a literal powder keg economically. If we are now at the same production levels of 2020, let's rewind to 2020 and see what happened then. We absolutely had a black swan event. A black swan event has already occurred. It was called the scamdemic. And during the scamdemic, there was no manufacturing because manufacturing of most products wasn't considered essential. So we are now in a fully robust, according to our administration today, robust economy, booming economy. We're in this booming economy where our manufacturing indices are as low as they were during a black swan event when people weren't allowed to go to work. That's just simple math. There's really no way around arguing that. You can't argue when these numbers come in because they are the most... They are the leading indicators for the future of the economic performance of this country. So while that happened, a 3% GDP, an increase in GDP occurred today. Uh, we are the largest concentration of, of stocks into certain sectors like uh, technology and healthcare. They're so overweighted. They remind every economist out there of the dot-com era and how overweighted we were in the exact same sectors. Again, a, 2000, a year 2000 indicator. So now we have 2000, 2008, and 2020. All three of those years were not good for, uh, for economies. Uh, on top of that, we have corporations that are now running an 8.8% cash budget. So what this means, if you're not familiar with that, is that essentially 8.8% of an entire company's assets are cash. So the rest could be uh, manufacturing facilities, real estate, inventory, uh, accounts, accounts receivable. A lot of these things are considered to be assets, but only 8.8% of their holdings are now in cash. This is very simple to explain. When stimulus money came out, it didn't just go out to the average person for a few hundred dollars or whatever. And I only got one of them, so I'd, I never received the other two. But whoever got them, it wasn't as nearly as much as Shell was getting or BlackRock or Walmart or these other companies. They were using that government stimulus check to buy back their own shares on the open market. These are called corporate buybacks. What they're doing is they're using free money to acquire more ownership in their companies, knowing that eventually the markets will change. They'll make more profits. So when the stock goes up, they make more money. They also have more control over the vote. So this is an approaching approaching that model of, of true socialism, even into fascism, which is a confusing topic, but uh, where the corporations are now working hand in hand. So the government gave them billions and billions and hundreds of billions of dollars for COVID money which they then started using to buy back stocks. This was no more apparent than it was in the oil and gas industry. That industry, all the major companies, your Shell, your Exxon, the companies that you thought were out there drilling wells, for the last two years, they've been buying back shares. They even told shareholders early on in 2022 to, to expect a 0 to 5% return over the next five years, which means that they were not interested in exploratory development or finding new wells or funding new wells. What they've been doing is acquiring land, and that acquisition period will continue to ramp up, primarily with stock swap acquisition, because they are now so low on cash. But this number at 8.8% for corporate cash holdings reminds almost all economists of the year 2008, when the average corporate holdings for the S is for the S&P 500, they were at 8% in 2008, because they just went through a big buyback period then as well. Didn't work out the same for them, but I think this time it's going to work out exactly the same as, as 2008. Uh, Dollar General is another great st uh, story. They missed their earnings numbers right now. They're having a hard time keeping employees. These dollar store companies are really important to an economy. Most of the products that are in the dollar stores right now aren't a dollar. They're $1.50. They're $3. In some cases, they're $5. These are inflationary trends that you can tell when the dollar stores are no longer a dollar, 
People stop shopping there. They actually stop buying it. A lot of their money in these general stores is spent on kids' toys, uh, you know, um, hand rack napkins and, and towels for the kitchen. Sometimes tools if you, if people don't have enough money to buy good tools. But most of the most of the the products that are in these stores are really discretionary spending. This is like where we used to take our kids when we would say, "Hey, you guys can go get a few toys." We take them to the Dollar General store. They got little toys. It was four or five dollars. Saved us money. They had fun. It's a big part of the American culture today that honestly never should have been because if we, if we never went off the gold standard, we wouldn't be worried about this. Uh, but the gold standard wasn't the standard you think it was because I'll repeat this over and over again. Every gold-backed currency in the history of the world has ended up collapsing at some point. Uh, a new paradigm is on the way. Uh, however, uh, 99,000 jobs have now been lost. 99,001 American jobs. Thank you, MacroEdge, for that data you send out every day. I love that Twitter account. I love going to your website. You've got some really good information there. Uh, again, back to the oil and gas industry, Shell announced that they're laying off 20% of their ex exploration and well development division. Uh, I was talking about this in 2022, that you were going to watch these big corporations take in government dollars and free money because a lot of the small and medium-sized independent drilling operations, are, are the inflation is killing them. And ultimately, they're going to have to sell the land they've developed to these other guys. They know what's coming. The, the, the private equity groups... Uh, BlackRock, this has always been funny to me that BlackRock, who who created the ESG movement and made it a big thing around the world, uh, that secretly, because I was in the industry at the time, they were going around looking to purchase oil and gas fields while they were forcing corporations to get away from oil and gas. This is no different than when Rockefeller created the temperance movement to eliminate alcohol in this country so that Henry Ford couldn't sell cars that ran on alcohol. Great research dig if you're interested in that. That's a true story happened in America. It's been happening in America for, forever. Foot Locker is moving their, their home office from New York. And I think if I read that article correctly, they had been there since inception. So Foot Locker has been around 40 or 50 years. And they are now moving their home office to Florida so that they don't have to pay New York taxes and so that their workers aren't going to be mugged, beaten, raped, or killed when they leave the office. Uh, good for you, Foot Locker. Hopefully all of you get a moving stipend to go get near the beach. Warren Buffett is still stacking cash. I've covered this many times. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway actually was the first non-technology company in history to reach a $1 trillion market cap. While that was, ha that happened a few days ago. While that was happening, Buffett cashed out another $986 million of Bank of America stock. This is his third withdrawal from Bank of America stock, equaling about... I don't know this number, so don't quote me on this, but I think it's about eight or nine billion dollars. He has more cash on hand to deploy for cheap assets than anyone in the history of mankind in a public market. There are certainly, there, listen, there are there are dozens, if not hundreds, of richer people than Warren Buffett. You just don't know their names. But as far as a public figure in the public market, he has one of the biggest cash stockpiles ever known to man, uh, which tells me a market collapse is coming up. Otherwise, a, a baron like himself wouldn't be stocking up on cash. He'd be buying other assets. Uh, along with that, uh, financially, I think one of the things we all need to look at right now is insurance rates. Uh, insurance companies, and I'm going to go into this at the end here near, near some of our state politics that are coming out right now because they're really terrifying. This is horrible, horrible laws are being passed in certain states. Certain states are doing a great job. Louisiana is kicking butt right now with what they're doing. But if you really look at the insurance model right now, insurance companies bend at the knee of politicians. The insurance companies have massive lobbyist groups. They lobby for all types of things, new types of insurance, uh, new asset class, approval for mandated insurance. I've talked about this and people argue with me about this and that's fine. I'm, I'm well open to open dialogue. Mandated insurance, I don't care if it's home insurance, car insurance, whatever it is, is a, is a tax. If you are forced to buy something with your money by a government, that is a tax. I believe heavily in private insurance, that's your choice. I do not believe in any government forcing you to buy insurance, especially when you don't have money and they're doing really horrible things with their own balance sheet. So the insurance companies themselves, insurance premiums have skyrocketed, despite the fact the CPI report every month tells us the, tells us the cost of health insurance is always going down. This last CPI said that health insurance premiums were drop or health insurance costs were dropping 33% in this country. I don't know a single person that I've talked to in real life that has told me that their health insurance is dropping. They're all skyrocketing because they can. They collaborate with government and lawmakers in order to be able to get away with these things. In fact, they need permission 
from governments to raise insurance rates. So lobbying and political uh, activists and protests, these things work with insurance companies too because they are raking in the money. They haven't had to do anything. Inflation doesn't hit insurance companies. They don't hold tangible assets. The only expenses they have are covering the cost of their insurance and their actual benefits for employees along with salaries and real estate and banking fees. That's it. So while you're getting killed with inflation, insurance barons are making a fortune off of your back. Which leads us right into insurance, which we should have illegal insurance, illegal migrant insurance, because in the state of Colorado, it's confirmed now that two apartment complexes are currently under the control of Venezuelan street gangs with a possible third that has not been officially confirmed. So let's just go ahead and call it confirmed. If you've ever seen the old gangster movie, um, New Jack City, this is what it reminds me of when the drug dealers took over the Carter. It's the same type of thing. All it takes is the backbone of a politician and a good SWAT team to get rid of these guys. These are, yes, they're armed, they're gang members, they're ruthless, but they're not tactically trained. So it, it boggles my mind that the mayor of Aurora, Colorado is doing multiple television interviews right now while his own citizens are being held at gunpoint and removed from their homes in which they pay taxes that pay his salary. These mayors need to stop doing the press whirlwind and do their job and hire a SWAT team to get these gangsters out of these buildings and return the homes to those who feed your government. This is a, a serious problem that is just beginning in this country. I'm not trying to be a, a doomer or make you afraid. I'm just a logical human being who understands numbers, game theory, and probability. And I can tell you, this is just the first time that we've heard of this. This has happened in many other places that we haven't heard about. I would guarantee that. And it's going to happen in other places because the gangsters get emboldened when their local police departments or even, even national guards don't defend their own citizens against what is clearly a crime wave in their city. The city of El Paso, where almost all of this stuff comes through, at least through Texas, uh, there in Eagle Pass, those two areas take on a bulk of the migrants that come in. El Paso has been uh, shipping these migrants all over the place, and right now they are about ready to, to declare a state of emergency in El Paso because they are also being overrun by Venez the same exact Venezuelan street gang. This is an organized crime unit. This isn't, you know, five guys on the corner in the 1970s singing doo-wop over a burning garbage can. These are organized gangsters that run billion dollar industries that involve drug dealing, extortion, child sex trafficking, human trafficking, prostitution, and murder. These are organizations that are run like well-oiled machines from the top down, and they need to be eliminated. San Diego, a uh, place I used to live, a place I love. San Diego's beautiful. This is horrible. This is happening. But in San Diego, in the last couple of days, Two different attempts to hijack school buses filled with children, elementary age and middle school age children. Illegals were pulling over the vans, armed illegals, trying to hijack buses full of children going to or coming home from school. This is a major problem. It correlates directly with Tom Holmes' new uh, recent information stating that 300,000 children illegals are missing from the borders. The child trafficking problem in this country is absolutely mind-boggling that no one talks about it. And when they do talk about it in this country, here's what happens. There's a new movie coming out called City of Dreams from Syl Sylvester Stallone. Old Sly is making a movie about child trafficking. Right now, influencers all throughout every network, especially Facebook and, and Instagram, they are being banned from talking about this movie. They do not want you to know that there is a serious child sex trafficking problem in America, as well as a child pornography problem that is way out of hand. Sin has overwhelmed the American society. It is literally time for this nation to have some backbone, turn back to God, and set things right. Now, along with this, because it's political in nature, uh, you can correlate th these things happening. So we already know illegals are taking over apartment complexes. Illegals are taking over El Paso. Illegals are trying to hijack children in San Diego. 300,000 illegal children are missing. And the most recent budget has come out on how much we've spent on these people to do these things to us at $150 billion. I don't buy it for a minute. I've read two other reports that suggest $325 billion to $454 billion they've spent of our money for people to come and take our homes, steal our children, and overrun our towns. 
This is not a game, nor is this fake. This stuff is really actually happening. And to boot, Kamala Harris just came out yesterday and said that on day one, she would sign an executive order to confiscate guns. I mean, really put this together. You have all this stuff happening in this country, and the person running for president is saying that she will take our guns on day one. Well, then how are we supposed to defend ourselves against armed guards? By the way, in Colorado, to kind of give you a picture of what's happening there, not only are three apartment complex overrun right now, uh, there have also been four gun store robberies. So how do you think they got the guns to take over the apartment complex? They robbed gun stores. You're telling me these gun stores don't have, they didn't leave fingerprints there's no video of these people. This is an inside job being constructed by local governments, which are getting more and more corrupt by the day. And if you're not active in your local government arena, you are doing yourself and your children a disservice at this point in America. Now, on to different topics. Uh, Pavel was just released by the, uh, Pavel Durov, the founder of Telegram, was just released, sort of, from the French. So he's charged with six crimes, not 12. They've reduced that down, but he is being held under supervised release and he has been formally indicted in France for crimes. And I'll rewind this and say, this is no different than charging the gun manufacturer because your neighbor was murdered. Uh, instead of charging the criminal, they're charging the gun manufacturer. And that's exactly what the, the analogy is for Telegram. He owned a platform. People do things on their platform. He's trying to not censor it and provide free speech. But what's happening is the other side is putting the pressure upon him by, this is the same thing they did with Bitcoin or anything else. It's used by criminals. You, everything is used by, it's what criminals do. Criminals find a way to take good things and make them bad and profit from it. When you want a free world, everyone should have access to technology, communication, and money. You cannot restrict it because they do bad things ahead of time. That's called the minority report, and that is a thought crime. When there's an actual crime, it's not the money's fault. It's not the gun's fault. It's the criminal's fault. If you find the criminals, then they won't have, then you can take their money and then you can take all the other things that they have, but you certainly can't restrict or create censorship on open sourced money or on, on social media accounts where people have free speech in their nation. Free speech is free speech. You're allowed to say things that offend people. That's the beauty of free speech. It's not to stop people from being offended. It's to learn that you shouldn't be offended by the words anyone says. They're just words. I mean, this is a ridiculous state that we're in right now. This report tonight, putting it together, I didn't realize that it would be this bad when I put it in this type of uh, flow. When you actually organize what's happening in the world, it's a little more disconcerting and a heck of a lot more educational. It helps you prepare. Now, the EU, on the other hand, when Pavel was arrested, the EU, which is I mean, reality, Dubai is the, the cool place there. You can move there now. Uh, they did something very cool. They froze an 80-jet order from the French military and defense sector there. Uh, that, is, that is billions and billions of dollars. They froze that order because they disagree with what they're doing with Pavel. So you're starting to see that punch-counterpunch coming again. The dark side will do something. The light will react. And eventually the light wins. It's just the way it is. Um, I'm praying for that every day. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the way I hope it is. I shouldn't say it's the way it is. It's really, history is not repeated that that's the way it is. This would actually be the first time where the good guys win in full, hopefully. Uh, Ukraine, this story is getting more interesting. I thought it would be more boring as time went along because it's obvious that Ukraine is getting their teeth kicked in by Russia, which was known by anyone with a, a brain in their head before it even started. However, uh, Zelensky has been out talking about seeking peace. I've talked about this a few times. Putin offered peace three different times. It was rejected by Ukraine because the Americans and the Israelis who work together on everything, it's not just them, we're an ally, allied nations were working to make sure that peace didn't take place. That's certainly a fact. But now it's even weirder because Zelensky is now saying he seeks peace, yet he's coming to America in September to pitch his victory plan to both the Harris and Trump campaigns. I don't know how going to a foreign nation who funds all of your whims and creates you know, millionaires all throughout your nation provides villas for your mother and Bentleys for your coworkers. I don't know how you can say in public that you're seeking peace yet going to a foreign country to ask for money to complete a victory plan. Uh, that is the lunacy uh, that continues. And at the same time, Russia has had enough of this now. The, the foreign minister has come out and said that we will not seek peace from here on out. We have tried. That game is over. You cannot say that you are seeking peace while you're doing drone strikes on the border and drone strikes within Russia all the way to Moscow. 
So that story will continue to develop because the more it develops, the more junk bonds that are printed by utility companies, the more money Western powers will make with those investments, and the more military equipment we can give them to continue to bolster the GDP and improve the numbers so your normal person continues to think that we live in a normal society with good economic numbers. Like I'm trying to tie this together for you all so you understand exactly what's happening uh, out there. Now the CCP, who we don't talk a whole lot about here because they don't really do press releases, but they did a public appearance today saying they realize and understand how bad the fentanyl problem is throughout the world, fentanyl, uh, fentanyl problem is around the world, and they are now going to restrict the production of certain ingredients that are used to make fentanyl. Uh, that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. That's a good thing. But I don't believe a single word that comes from the CCP. I think this is a great way of uh, gaining favor as BRICS grows and a way for them to be able to say, well, we're trying to help the world, so don't call us the bad guy. Uh, it's not necessarily the Chinese people or the nation of China. The CCP is comprised of the same, you know, communists that exist in every country. They're all a network because they have a certain flag next to their name on television. Doesn't mean they have an alliance to that nation. And they will say absolutely anything to make themselves look good and the people who are trying to defeat them look terrible. So take that for what it's worth, but it did, it did come out today. The CCP is restricting production of certain ingredients used to make fentanyl, which in theory would reduce the fentanyl crisis in this country, although I doubt it. Now on to the U.S. elections and some of the things we're seeing now. So uh, an election official came out, did an interview on television stating that Arizona currently has between 500,000 and 1.13 or 1.3 million illegals still on their voter roll. I think this is a good thing that they're coming out and saying it's a bad thing that it exists, but it's a good thing that they're saying this at this juncture because it's raising awareness and hopefully we'll see, see the same type of voter roll purge that we've seen in Pennsylvania, in one area, small area of Pennsylvania, areas of Louisiana, the entire state of Texas. Uh, these voter rolls need to be purged and election laws need to be ch changed. And we need to see more things happening like we saw in Wisconsin where local areas are banning ballot boxes because mail-in voting is exactly what they're trying to target right now. And I'm going to get into that in just a second. Uh, Iran is now announcing, or at least it's a breaking story, that Iran has increased their stockpile of uranium. It's kind of an interesting story, but it also goes into a very good dig if you like to learn things. There is, uh, Iran has been a problem for a long time. And it's just like every other nation in the world. I'm sure there's a ton of good people there just trying to live their life the same way we are. But Iran has always been a nuclear threat. And the nuclear threat is an ancient uh, war story between Israel and Iran, uh, which is probably run by the same people in the background. And they use the media to make it a division. I think it's a, co a coordinated effort. Uh, maybe time will prove me wrong. But until then, I think that's probably a safe guess. However, if you're worried about nuclear weapons in Iran, if you want to do a good dig on the Internet, look up Stuxnet, S-T-U-X-Net. It's a computer program that was embedded into uh, almost every, actually not almost every mass manufactured piece of technical equipment in the 90s and, and 2000s, all the way through about 2011. It's a pretty irrelevant code that's on your computer. It's on every computer, your phone, everything. But I had a chance on an airplane to actually talk with a guy who was the first cybersecurity professional and longest tenured professional at the DOD. And we had a good conversation. I said, what can you tell me? That's really cool to learn. He told me about Stuxnet. Uh, and if he's watching the show, because I gave him the link, I doubt he is. But if he is, thank you for the story. And thank you for that great uh, plane ride. I rarely talk to people on planes. Uh, and this year I've had great conversations. But he told me about Stuxnet, the purpose of Stuxnet, that they put it into all of these hardware devices in every major manufacturer through the world is because the Stuxnet code actually is linked together to be able to control the heat or the temperature of an Iranian nuclear centrifuge. Uh, that is a cool story any way you look at it. So although they keep pumping this Iranian nuclear threat, I think it's important to understand that Stuxnet exists. Uh, I did about 10 hours of research on it after that flight and everything that I saw online leads to the same thing. So in theory, we have a computer code embedded into hardware that has to be used in their laboratory that we can actually control, push up or push down the centrifuge temperature on any of their nuclear centrifuge. Like that is a really, really cool story. Um, California, former Californian here, uh, not a lot moved there from the Midwest, but California, guys, this isn't looking good. You know, aside from the fact that the Chinese have been buying your homes in cash since 2020, 
Uh, the fact that everyone is overextended and everything you pay for there is so ridiculously expensive. I always tell people the story. I moved from Cal. I love uh, Planners Mixed Nuts, Deluxe Mixed Nuts, the big cans, my favorite snack. And I used to buy them in California one at a time because they were 14 to $16 no matter where I went. When I moved to Texas, I went to the store, they were $7.99, and I asked the, the guy at the grocery store if that was a mistake. And he said, no, are, are they on sale? He goes, no, that's the normal price. I bought the whole shelf immediately. So things are cheaper everywhere else. I'm just going to let you know that. But they just did, they passed SB 1414 a couple of weeks ago. I saw a great video that reminded me of this today. That basically means if you buy or sell a child for sex, you know, just, but you know, common thing people do, I guess. They buy and sell children for sex. If you do that in California, your maximum sentence is going to be one year and two days plus a $10,000 fine. Most of those instances will be two-day sentences because of the way the law is written. But the penalty for buying or selling a child illegally for sexual purposes is two days, one year, $10,000 max penalty. In my opinion, and I'll put this on air, uh, it's very cheap uh, to solve this problem. Shovels and, and, and rounds are fairly inexpensive if you harm children, especially if you sell them. I think that's maybe the most wicked thing in the world. And it's, it's so common right now that they're passing bills to reduce the sentences for it happening. They also banned voter ID in local election centers. So the only thing in the world that they argue for in any political stance right now is that we don't need voter ID because that's racist. Now, if you ask white liberals, they will, they will chime right along. They will sound like the mockingbird that they are, and they will say, people of color in disenfranchised in areas don't have access to DMVs because they're taught that in college with our tax money. They're taught that in high school with our tax money. And our media, which also gets our tax money, tells them this every day. The reality is I don't know a single, I don't have a single friend out there of color, whether they're black, Mexican, Chinese, Indian, I have a lot of friends of all, I don't know one of them that doesn't have an ID. And now in California, they're not only saying you don't need ID for local elections, they're banning the use of IDs in local elections. Your local politics are far more important than you realize, and they're also the hardest politics to get any information on. So get involved in your local areas, especially in California. The other tragedy that's happening out there is that all state insurance just, and this is key when you read the article. So look, look, verify everything I'm telling you. Don't take what I'm telling you verbatim. I'm not here to be the, the information source. I'm, I'm trying to stimulate your mind to look further into things for yourself because you will learn things I don't have time to teach today. And more importantly, I hope you share it with me so I learn something too. Now, all state, major insurance company, they just got, this is a key word, they just got approval. They got approval to raise homeowner insurance rates throughout the state of California on an average of 34%. That's not the end of the story. That's the average, depending on where you live and how risky it is for the, for the insurance company. They can raise those rates as high as, by law, 650%. So hypothetical number, say you're paying $1,000 a month for home insurance. It might be 6,500. It's certainly going to be 1,300. That's definitely happening if you have Allstate. So get, if you're in California, get out of Allstate from your home and homeowner's insurance and get away from them as fast as possible. This is how you protest these things. And I will remind you that in the article and in the press release from Allstate, they received approval. There are insurance boards that exist that give approval for rates. Here's another interesting fact. In the pharmaceutical industry, you ever wonder why we have so many pharmaceutical com uh, commercials on television today? First of all, they control every lobby, number one. That should, should be known. This country, the lobbyist nation, is run by those who are behind Big Pharma. But just like insurance, Big Pharma has pricing boards. So to run any human trial, it doesn't matter what human trial you're running for whatever disease, you know, you, you're never really going to spend more than maybe eight to $10 million. It's just, you don't need to, to prove a point scientifically. I have experience in this. So let's call it 5 million on average. You spend 5 million on a, a human trial. You have production costs for the pills, which are like a, a penny a piece, but you're going to get $10 for them. And then you, then you have to find a way to increase your price that you get from the insurance company before you go to the insurance board. So before you go to the insurance board to get insurance pricing opinion from this pricing board, 
what you do is you put together a $500 million marketing budget. That actually, by law, is allowed to be included in the pricing board's assessment of how much a drug will cost. Now, I know we all have co-pays and you get a drug from the doctor and you pay $15 or $20 or whatever it is and you get your drugs. Those insurance companies make their money off your, sit, your sitting premiums. They make your money off the money you don't use and they pay the big pharma companies big, big bucks. So if you're paying a $15 copay, look at your actual receipt for your drugs. They're gonna be $1,200, $1,500. That money is being paid to the pharmacy or to the, to the pharmaceutical company through the insurance company. This is why they continue to jack up these prices. So this example, insurance is no different. They bundle up insurance. They say, well, this is our new risk. This is how it's riskier now than it was last year. Here are our reasons to raise rates because it's gonna cost us money. It's gonna eat into our profit center. And pharma is no different. So you have 5 million for a human trial, maybe a few million dollars for the initial run of production. You bank it out 10, 15 years and say, if this drug is successful, it's gonna be another 5 million, 10 million to produce it but we have to spend $500 million paying off doctors and running you know, commercials on CNN and Fox 71% of the time during the news. So that is gonna cost us a lot of money. So instead of charging you know, 10 cents per pill, we need like $13 per pill. This is how it all works. This is how the world really, really works and insurance is no different. So your political influence that you have, your, your voice in this country can be used for more things than just trying to get a, a state senator to, to get rid of you know, critical race theory. You could be using it to lower your own drug costs. America doesn't know that. They don't know how these things work. But I promise you over the course of the next two years, we're all going to learn, we're all going to share, and we're going to figure out how to get through this because this price of an average of 34% increase in homeowner's insurance is a death sentence to anyone who's living on a razor thin budget. And that is intended. You will own nothing and be happy is what Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum who runs the world partially with many other groups. This is what they've been telling you for two and a half years. They're not gonna come in and steal your house. They're gonna use all their levers of power through financial influence to steal every penny you have. So you have to sell what you have to get by for another couple years. They sweep it up, it becomes a rental. California, you are on your pathway to certain renterdom. If you think you own a home, I don't even care how much money you have. If you live in the Hollywood Hills or if you live in uh, Malibu, you might, be, you might get out of this for a few years, but eventually it's gonna be overrun unless you people stand up. It's very important. Now, the most disturbing political story today comes out of Montana. And this correlates with college sports, which I don't talk about sports a whole lot. I was a sports nut. Uh, I, I actually have a fantasy draft that I'm not even paying attention to. I'm just putting on an auto draft. I was a big sports and I was an athlete, uh, love sports. I think they're fantastic for, for kids, for entertainment, all that stuff. But I started to realize over the course of my life that it was just a big distraction that kept me from understanding the things I'm sharing with you today. And had I known then what I know now, I'd be in a better place. So I don't really watch them that much. And I stopped watching pro sports altogether when they started wearing you know, equity on the back of their jersey and the BLM stickers. I mean, it just was the end. I, I wanted to watch sports at that point in my life to get away from the political chaos. And when you can't get away from the chaos and the one thing you liked doesn't do that for you anymore, you leave. That's what a sound mind does. And one of the big tragedies that I think, and I, being a former college athlete, I, I, I'm, I'm split down the middle, whether I think it's a good or bad thing, but they started paying college athletes a few years ago through the NIL program. And this NIL program, as soon as they approved it, I remember telling my father, I go, that's the end of college sports. There are no college athletes. They're now miniature pros. You know, uh, Eli Manning's uh, nephew, who's a third string quarterback for the University of Texas, he made $3.8 million last year in college and didn't even play. He didn't even play a single down. He made $3.8 million. The reason they pay these athletes so much money is because they ultimately want to control them. They already control the professional athletes. How many NFL, NBA, or MLB players have you heard speak out about any of the lunacy that we've had in this country or the communist tactics? The few that have have lost their jobs. The few that have have lost their endorsement deals or they've lost their career altogether and now they're playing you know, point guard in Serbia. Uh, this is how it really works. Now they're doing this in the college ranks in Montana. In Montana, they are now, through the NIL program, they are now incentivizing college athletes in the state of Montana to promote a guy named John Tester, a Democrat, running for one of their vulnerable seats this upcoming election. I want you to really think about how dirty this is. 
Number one, they are dirtying up taxpayer money, right? That's taxpayer money that they're going to run through the NIL program and stipend these college athletes. So not only is college sports tainted because they're no longer college athletes, they are professional athletes who don't even pay for college. They're making $3.8 million a year and have free tuition. That's not fair to another student, uh, period. And I was an athlete and I had a scholarship and I still think it's unfair. I don't care how you look at it or what it means to you. It's unfair. Now they're using these young kids, these young boys and girls uh, who are dedicated, hardworking people. Like to be a college athlete, you have to sacrifice a tremendous amount of your life. When other kids are out partying, you're in a weight room. When other people are on spring break, you're playing tournaments. Uh, there's a dedication to this. And that dedication makes you a little bit naive. And I've dealt with a lot of professional football players. I've been to DC and I've pitched in front of the NFL PA in my career. And I learned a lot along the way. I learned a lot of these athletes make millions and millions of dollars and they were bankrupt within three to five years because those college years, you're missing that, 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 that time to develop your mind financially and, and to use discernment. College students don't have discernment. I didn't. I, I, it's not a bad thing. I didn't have it either. I would have taken any, I would have promoted anybody in college for a free Subway uh, sandwich and a medium diet Pepsi, you know, these kids are broke, but now that they have some money, they're incentivizing college athletes with taxpayer money to promote a Democrat so that he can take a seat in the Senate and continue the communist takeover of America. These are the realities of the world that we live in. This is nothing I've said on here is make-believe. Everything I said in here, I can verify and back with links and reference points. And in many cases, conversations with people who deal with these things with firsthand approval that this stuff is real. To boot, we also have the CDC who was FOIA, uh, Freedom of Information Act. I don't know if many Americans even know what FOIA is, but you have the, the ability in this country to file FOIA forms and request very confidential information. This is how the world found out that Anthony Fauci was making millions of dollars because it was in emails. You can file FOIA requests to get information about things that happen within the government that they're not telling us about. And this just happened and it confirmed a very long standing conspiracy theory out there CDC now confirms through a FOIA request that the COVID-19 virus has never been isolated. Has never been isolated. If you don't know what that means, it means it's never been separated from everything else and studied thoroughly. So literally the fact that they have never isolated COVID-19 scientifically tells us that they don't know anything about it and can't actually prove that it exists because they've never isolated it. You can isolate anything, anytime. You can isolate carbon atoms. You can isolate oils from trees. You can isolate anything you want to. And the CDC, through a FOIA request, has now been confirmed to have never isolated the COVID-19 virus. On the same day that this information comes out, The Hill, which could easily be called the shill.com, The Hill came out with a big article about how COVID is back on the rise through this summer and we may be looking at lockdowns. So, gee, guys, let's do a quick rundown of where we are during election season. Three and a half months, five months ago, actually, five months ago, Russian submarines and warships arrived in Cuba. I have not heard a story confirming or denying that they have left. We have 21 million migrants in this country. We have states that have self-admittedly have up to 1.3 million of them on their voter rolls. We have illegal immigrants taking over apartment complexes, trying to hijack school buses filled with children. The city of El Paso is overrun. And in the middle of this, we have uh, multiple towns in two different counties in Massachusetts that are self-quarantining for another airborne disease from a mosquito called Triple E. We have another one I can't pronounce that came out yesterday. And we have West Nile virus along with monkeypox. Do you think it's election season yet? Can you see all the excuses that are being built in? The only thing that's missing, which is probably coming sometime in late December or October would be my guess, is gonna be the next phase of the cyber attack. Everyone's expecting this big cyber attack, but we've already had big cyber attacks that have, some of the biggest cyber attacks that have ever occurred in US history have already happened. From CrowdStrike all throughout the board, there's a lot of them out there that have already happened. And I think what they're doing, just like an animal would test an electric fence, you're trying to figure out how you can shut down different verticals, sectors, and vectors within a system so that ultimately you can either shut off the grid or you can shut off the, the wireless or the internet and you will absolutely be able to control an election through electronic means. So that is, that is, 
That is the scoop for today. That is the chaos of today between money and politics. But I want to end everything here before we go to questions and answers uh, on religion. And I use the word religion. I don't even believe in religion. I just use it because that's the old adage, you know, never talk politics or religion, which are the two things you should talk about. It shouldn't be religion. It should be faith. Uh, It shouldn't be church. It should be relationship. But I will say this. Uh, A good friend of mine, uh, congratulations, Dan, uh, just had another baby boy today, a very healthy baby boy. He's a member of our men's ministry, and I'm so happy for him, so proud for him. I know he watches this, so congratulations to you and the family. Uh, this was the third person that I'd heard today who had a baby today. Uh, you know, I'm 47 years old. I don't have a whole lot of friends that are having babies still. And to hear three different families that had babies today, along with at least five other people on our prayer board and our chat on Telegram today, uh, there are multiple people getting ready to have new babies. So in the midst of all this chaos around the world, there's tremendous joy that enters And we have this ability as human beings to just focus in on the negative, to focus on the bad things. But the Bible tells us to focus on what's beautiful, what's pure, what's admirable, what's good. And if we take this day, we can look at it and say, you know what, this is, this is crazy. There are illegals and all this stuff. Or we can look at it and say, you know, people are having babies. Families are growing. American families are growing. Our birth rate is almost zero. So hearing people that are having babies right now and hearing about young couples getting married and buying houses, these are good things that we need to learn to protect. We protect this thing through a a backbone as a society, having the, the, the stones to be able to stand up to what is wrong, what is misinformation and malinformation, and to be able to put our foot down when people from other countries are stealing our land. So, you know, I want to wrap this up before Q&A just by simply saying that no matter what is happening around the world, no matter what is happening with school buses and apartment buildings and economies and corrupt politicians, in, all, in the midst of all that chaos, God is still bringing beautiful souls to this nation. He is still bringing beauty and joy and love into households. He is still providing for people who are weary. He's making them strong. He's providing energy to the world. And he's doing it through bringing new, amazing souls to earth. So I choose, I will never ignore the reality of the world. I study the enemy. I don't study mythological plans of what good guys may do. I study the enemy and I study the, my, my allies. But I always study that in everything. So I can look at, I just told you what the devil is doing in the world. But at the same time, God is bringing new bodies, new people, new amazing souls to each and every one of us. So... Uh, I think we can take that away from the day here and and go ahead and open up for a couple questions and answers before we shut it down. But it's almost bedtime here. Uh, quick couple notes here at the end. Uh, Saturday afternoon, like we did with the history of World War II video, uh, we're going to do a freestyle uh, Bitcoin workshop and just talking about crypto and a little bit about the history, mo- mainly about the history of money. So unless you understand why crypto exists, which goes back to the, the early 70s and, and in some instances, the late 60s, Uh, There's a great video. It's on my Telegram channel and my Twitter. Uh, But if you aren't following me on either one of those, I believe you can just go to YouTube and and type in, excuse me, got a bug in my throat tonight. Uh, You can simply type in cypherpunks write code. And there's a 45 minute documentary on the entire history, the battle that's taken place to create cryptographic products or using cryptography to provide secrecy, confidential nature of communication and money, I think it's important to know, pr- try to watch that as best you can, um, you know, before before we do our workshop on Saturday. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I know there'll be people who don't want to hear it, and that's that's fine too. Uh, I'm not, I don't care if you buy Bitcoin. I don't care if you buy crypto. I don't care if you buy, that's up to you. you. This is a world of free choice, a world of, of free decisions. All I'm trying to do with my free time uh, in my life is to be able to provide some education to people out there so they make more informed decisions. That's the best I can do. I certainly won't be, uh, I am a Bitcoiner. I I, I believe wholeheartedly in it at this point in time. I've spent enough time there. Don't care if you do or not, but I certainly think you should listen to some education and understand what it is and what it's not and determine it for yourself and then make your own decision. I think it's the best way to do anything. So uh, that said, yes, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, congratulations, my friend. A lot of you guys, thank you for putting the congratulations to my friend Dan up there. He is actually going to be on the show eventually. He's got a baby now, so it'll be months. But uh, we had talked for a long time to have him come on and and, and do the show with me uh, as a co-host. And I have a few friends that I'm probably going to do that with in the end when I get, you know, the studio reset up for that type of stuff. So 
Uh, until then, let's just look through if you guys have any other topics you want to discuss or anything I can help you with here tonight. I'll be more than happy to. Uh, if not, I'll be definitely more than happy to go back to my family. Uh, and I think that we will uh, we'll definitely see you on Saturday. I'll probably do a show tomorrow in the afternoon. Uh, we have some stuff to do for the family tomorrow night. And uh, I'd love to have a movie night with my kids uh, if they're willing to do that with their old man. So hopefully we can we can get that done. So it doesn't look like we have any questions or concerns tonight. Thank you, everybody. Uh, everybody for congratulating Jeff and, and, and Dan. And it's so nice to have you here tonight. So until next time, I'm Eric Rice. This is the Rice Report Live. God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless this country. We'll see you again tomorrow.